We're very lucky to have two wonderful birds to show you today. The one I'm holding is a pygmy falcon. This is not only one of the smallest birds of prey in the world, it is the smallest bird of prey in Africa, and it's the smallest falcon in the world. And this little bird catches rodents, mice, insects, and amazingly, other birds about its own size. Now in contrast, Jim Fowler is holding a marvelous huge eagle called the Marshall Eagle. And this is one of the largest eagles in the world. Those sharp talons help the Marshall Eagle catch its prey. The Marshall Eagle, by the way, catches small antelopes, monkeys, hyraxes, and some larger rodents. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Today, we're in Kenya. We've been listening to Sandy Price, who's an internationally known conservationist, presenting a conservation lesson sponsored by the wildlife clubs of Kenya to educate youngsters here in Africa. Because of her special interest in wildlife, Laura Grove, a Girl Scout from Milford, Nebraska, was selected to accompany us on this important trip to Kenya. The main objective of this trip is to give Laura an opportunity to observe how women are instrumental in wildlife conservation in Africa. Laura will observe one exciting research project in Amboseli National Park with Sandy Price, and I'll join them later. We've enjoyed showing these birds to you today, and thank you for being such an attentive audience. Here, I'll take the falcon from you. Thanks, Jim. We'll join you on the camel safari. See you later. Okay. We're going to be moving out in a truck, and our guide is Evelyn Wanjohi. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Evelyn. We're going to take a look at the elephants first today, Laura. Those are Thompson gazelles, Laura. Beautiful animals. These are wildebeest. They're also called gnus. They and the zebras graze here on the Amboseli grasslands in large numbers. Here, where it's more wooded, is where the elephants come to feed. Since this is a national park, they're quite accustomed to seeing vehicles nearby, so we'll be able to get a good close look at them. Laura, aren't they magnificent? They sure are. This herd has a good many calves, and the adults guard them very closely. Elephants are fast learners and the calves quickly discover the best way to discourage insects from biting is to coat one's back with dust. Sandy, are all these elephants in the same family? That's right, Laura. This is a family unit of elephants, with the oldest, largest female as the leader, some of her offspring, and usually a sister or two. And these units range in size from 3 to 20 animals. How long do elephants live? Around 70 years, just like humans, and their growing up is about the same. A young elephant, like this, reaches adolescence at age 14. When they're very young, like this cute little fellow, they're vulnerable to lion attack, so they stay close to the adults. We've probably been near this herd long enough, so we'll move on. Here's an unusual situation, so let's stop. That herd of elephants in the distance has evidently lost one of its members, a tusker who died, and now the lions have moved in. Even the biggest lions could not kill a tusker of this size, but the cats are swift to take advantage of the situation when one dies of illness or old age. This may not be a pleasant sight, Laura, but it's all part of nature's plan. 
nothing is wasted in nature, and those who die help those who remain to survive. We are now entering the area where Evelyn is doing her scientific research. Stop here, Sandy. Over there are the black rhinos whose movements I have been recording. These animals are among the most endangered species in Africa, and we keep a very close watch over them. By using these cards, I can identify specific animals. The cattle egrets stay close to catch whatever insects the rhino's movements disturb. This is great. Do you think we'll see any more rhinos today? No, because rhino numbers have been reduced severely by poachers. We're going to leave Evelyn now and go to meet Mary O'Brien, who is doing some very important research on baboons just north of here. Laura and I are now at Chalolo Ranch, where we'll observe the work of Mary O'Brien. Three troops of baboons have been translocated up here, and I've been studying how they adapt to the new environment. Several of the animals have been fitted with radio collars, and we study them using telemetry equipment. Laura, you'll see that Mary has a receiver that will pick up the signals from the baboons and lead us to them. They shouldn't be too far away from here. This area was selected for the relocation of the baboons because it was similar to the area where they came from. I'm going to stop up ahead here for a moment so you'll be able to get a good look at that reticulated giraffe. They're such stately animals. Why are they called reticulated giraffe? That's because the pattern of their spots is so well defined. Reticulated simply means a net-like pattern of markings. I'll move away from these rocks a little for better radio reception in locating the telemetry signals. This should do it. Mary will hear a beep in her earphones when she aligns the antenna with the signal. Almost immediately, she hears it and determines the direction it's coming from. Now, Mary will try to pinpoint the exact area where the baboons are by taking a compass reading. She finds that the animals have moved somewhat from where they were the last time she checked. She will note the new site on her map, and this will help establish the pattern of their movements. The troop is close by. So we should see them shortly. Here we are in the area that Mary's telemetry equipment pinpointed, where one of the translocated baboon troops has taken up residence. So let's stop and begin our observations. Laura, Mary will be noting if the troop has lots of healthy babies. If they do, it's an indicator of successful relocation. Can we get fairly close to the baboons? Yes, they're extremely tame because they've been studied at close range for so many years. Look, over there is the big alpha male baboon wearing the telemetry collar transmitting the radio signal. He's the leader of the troop. So far, Laura, all the females we've seen have babies, and they all look very well fed and healthy. The babies are fun to watch, but it's primarily the adults that Mary is here to observe. 
so she'll get on with that while you and I look around by ourselves. Hold it, Laura. We have to move cautiously and be very quiet now so we don't frighten the impalas. As you can see, the baboons are living in harmony with the antelope that are native to this area, which is very important. Look over there. Two males are fighting. The fighting doesn't seem to have caused any reaction from those two ostriches guarding their eggs. They have their eye on a baboon who is a little too near. Mm. Mm. Sandy, are they always that aggressive? No, usually only when nesting. Come on, let's see how Mary's doing. If baboons are to be successfully translocated, it becomes extremely important for scientists like Mary to document all their activities in this new territory. It is necessary to know that the baboons are adapting to new vegetation and learning which plants are edible and which are not. It is also important to know that they are engaging in their social activities, like grooming. Is that one looking for bugs? No. Actually, they're looking for salt crystals that have formed on the skin, which they love to eat. From all indications, the translocated baboons are doing very well here. They are adapting perfectly to their new territory. Here, they used to good advantage the food-finding skills that had served them well in their previous range. This baby has already learned that sometimes, under rocks, there are insects or grubs that are good to eat. All he needs is a strong helping hand from his mother. Nothing here. But there are always other rocks to check that might be hiding food treasures. While Mary continues with her work here, you and I had better move on. We have a long drive ahead of us to our next location, where we have an entirely different kind of adventure in store. Now Laura and I are going to Galana Ranch, where Jim Fowler is setting up our camel safari. Laura and I are now at Galana Ranch, and one of the most exciting ways to get up close to wildlife here is on camels. They are just now getting the last camel to kneel so that it can be saddled. Jim Fowler has arranged the safari, which will be led by Galana Ranch manager, Henry Henley. Well, we're here. Glad you made it. First, Laura, meet the newest member of Galana Ranch. He's only a day old. Is it all right if I pet him? Sure. He's so soft. He's also gentle. All the camels here at Galana have been bred for gentleness and are treated like pets. I never really thought I'd actually be going for a ride on a camel. Oh! Oh! 
Hang on, Laura. Uh, oh! That wasn't so bad. <laughs> Well, let's begin our little caravan. We won't have to go far to find wildlife because just outside the camp are some fringe-eared oryxes. They're part of the experiments being carried on here at the Galana Ranch to successfully raise and even breed African wildlife under controlled conditions. These experiments might be the solution to keeping certain species of native animals from becoming extinct. They sure have long horns. And sharp, too. They're terrific defense weapons. These animals survive not only because they can defend themselves, but also because they have adapted well to the vegetation that grows here. The oryx is also an animal that can exist in this very dry climate. He can go a couple of days without water. Oryx are reasonably tame on this vast Galana ranch, but there are many wild species here that we should be on the lookout for. Laura, those are cheetahs over there. They're terrific hunters. That big guinea fowl could be in trouble. The cheetahs won't have guinea fowl for lunch today. That was really close. Laura, I hope you're beginning to settle into that saddle a little better than I am. You know, these camels are really amazing, though. They'll eat almost any of these shrubs around here where other animals are pretty specialized on just certain species of vegetation. You see the buffalo over there? That's a herd of maybe up to 200 animals, and the buffalo, of course, are strictly grazers and range throughout vast areas around here just to get enough to eat. They're also dependent upon water, so they stay pretty close to the water hole. And I suspect that tonight we're going to hear the sounds of lions around our camp, because with all these buffalo around, one thing you learn is that wherever there are buffalo, there are usually lions following the herd. We've only traveled over a very small portion of this million and a half acre ranch, but we've seen a lot and we're not quite finished yet. Up ahead is one of the many resident wild herds of zebras found here. These animals are not presently part of the wildlife domestication program. Zebras seem to have a red tent. Yeah, that's right. In fact, if you'll notice, the soils here are quite red in color. And the zebra has a habit of rolling in the soils with great frequency. We could spend days or even weeks on this gigantic ranch and still have new sights to see, but our time is running out. We have now come full circle and are back at the camp where we started our safari. As was promised, the camels turned out to be an unusual and memorable means of travel.
Well, Laura, I think I'll recommend you for a badge in camel riding. Gee, thanks, Jim. Laura, Sandy and I want you to know how much we enjoyed your coming along on this trip with us. It was a terrific experience and one I will never forget. The success of all wildlife conservation programs depends on the training and dedication of the men and women who implement them. Important to the future of these programs are the women scientists who serve as role models for youngsters who are considering a career in wildlife conservation. The worldwide efforts of both men and women scientists will be needed if a number of species of wildlife are to always remain a part of our wild kingdom. <laughs>